Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. I am your host, Ray Harkins. I am sitting here on my computer speaking to you fine people from episode number 44. Our guests this week are, I always say are, it's like the royal we. Anyways, my guest this week for you, Scott Vogel from the band Terror. And uh, for any of you that have ever paid attention to independent music, you probably are aware of the name. More on him in a moment. Propertyofzack.com is a great site. They uh, have been receiving a lot of notoriety as of late in regards to all their reporting on Fallout Boy. And um, yeah, it's pretty awesome to see a site like Property of Zach be cited in like the New York Times and US Today, USA Today and a bunch of other crazy stuff. But uh, regardless, it just sh- it shows the type of reporting that they're doing. So um, go to that site, get up to date with what's happening with your favorite bands or bands you hate, either or. Um, and be in the know because everybody likes to be in the know. So, uh, yeah, visit their site. We are proud to be working with them. Go to the show's website, 100wordspodcast.com. I post cool shit I find on the internet on a almost daily basis. And, uh, yeah, it's fun. You can correspond with the show that way. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, email the show. I've been having some fun discussions with people over email. Um, that either say my podcast is stupid and you should try to get better quality mics or whatever. But no, in all honesty, I have been appreciating all of the feedback I've been getting from people. Um, and it's awesome. And people are even nice enough to like want to help. And it's awesome. And I appreciate that. Um, you can also review the show. We're getting, I want to get to a hundred, a hundred reviews, On iTunes, we're getting close. We have like 77. Um, And when I say reviews, I mean star rankings. So two seconds. Pop in there. Tell how many stars you think this show's worth. And if you want to spend like a minute and a half writing something, I do appreciate that. I obsessively check it and I read it. And there's been like two or three reviews over the past like few weeks. And that's awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, And I appreciate any time a person's like, Ray is awesome. Thumbs up. Thank you. You don't need to say that. You can just talk about the show, but I appreciate that, and I appreciate you. There's a lot of appreciation going on here. Um, And then one last final bit of business. This week, more particularly this weekend, the February 23rd, if you are in the Southern California area, you should come hang out at the Glass House in Pomona. My old band Taken is doing a reunion show. We're brushing the dust off, and we're going to get up there on the stage and play some songs that we know. Um, it's all for a good cause though. Um, the old sound guy at Chain Reaction, he uh, tragically passed away last summer, the summer of 2012, uh, and his wife was pregnant with uh, a daughter and she is born, uh, I think in early February. And so the show is to benefit her, uh, because obviously she doesn't have a father, uh, only one income as far as the family is concerned. And that is really difficult. So, throwing the whole show in celebration of her uh, and to in memory of Christian as well. So, sorry, I was just thinking about how I wanted to put that. But, uh, yeah, so come to the show, The Glass House of Pomona, February 23rd. Other bands are Hello Goodbye, Dakota, Roy English. It's a random show. Like, I will 100% admit that. But it's for a good cause, and, uh, yeah, you can come hang out. And, I mean, the show's cheap. Like, there's just no reason that you shouldn't be there. So fucking go. Um, Scott Vogel, he is an amazing dude. Um, Like, he's so ubiquitous within, like, the hardcore punk scene that it's like, I don't even know how to describe the guy. But basically, he is the vocalist for some of your favorite bands. He currently sings in a band called Terror. Used to sing in a band called Slugfest back in the day. Used to sing in a band called Despair. Also played in a band called Buried Alive. He is what I like to call a lifer. And um, yeah, so I, I went to his house. We talked for a long time. And this was actually the day that I went over was the day that they were releasing the news that they had signed to Victory Records. So it was really interesting because Scott was like, some weird shit's going to go down today, man. And so he kind of told me and I was like, wow, that's definitely going to cause a lot of people being like, what the shit is happening? 
So, uh, yeah, Victory Records, for those that don't know, um, you know, they were a very large mainstay within the hardcore scene. And then, you know, the label got gigantic with bands like Hawthorne Heights and Taking Back Sunday. Whatever. You can do the research. You know what's up. Um, but anyways, yeah, Scott was very candid and revealing. And uh, we discussed his uh, his life and all his trials and tribulations and uh, ultimately is what led him to where he's at currently. Um, but above all, it's like his persona of how he is on stage uh, definitely doesn't translate to how he is as a person. Um, he's still completely positive and, uh, you know, engaging as a person, but he's just not as, uh, whatever. We talk about misconceptions in this interview, so you'll get it. Anyways, I could go on for a long time about him, but I won't. Um, so yeah, check out the discussion. I, fucked up and I didn't record like the first maybe five minutes of our conversation. Um, so you'll join us maybe at a point where, um, you know, we're basically, we're talking about his parents and he was raised in the upstate New York area and all that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, that, I think that's the only information that you will miss, but that's it. So, you know, humans, we make errors. And I was like, oh shit, I didn't record the first few minutes, but fortunately I caught it then as opposed to the end of the interview I said, thanks Scott. And I was like, oh wait, I don't have anything. So here you go. Here's Scott Vogel and I will talk to you afterwards. want to move on from like did, did your dad was was he kind of just I, trying to check out i don't know yeah yeah uh uh there was no at that point because when we get we'll get later i'll tell you what happened but at sure. that point there was no question we were staying with my mom I, I don't know his take on it but right 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 it, and I, I just I was and i remember like because I, I often do think of like all right how different would have my life have been if like my father won custody and I was raised by him, like I ended up having a good relationship with him, like later on down the line. Right. But like, do you, do you, do you, does that thought ever cross your mind where it's like, wow, what if my dad was like, you know, what if my dad was like what my mom was to me now? Well, let me give you this. Please give it. Spin. (laughs) So, so, um, uh, my dad gets remarried to to this lady and they, she has a, son from a previous marriage so my stepbrother okay um so i'm with my mom up until uh fifth sixth grade okay um sixth grade my mom goes to her high school reunion okay (laughs) re (laughs) reconnects with some guy okay and literally within what seems a month or two, she's like, we're moving to Texas with this guy. Holy shit. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> were, you, were, you, what, were you and your sisters like just like, I, what the fuck? I don't even know. Right. But, <laughs> so what happens was my dad comes to us mm-hmm. and I, I got to be blunt. You yeah. Know? My dad's a little older now and I don't want to bash him too much but no I we would go see him on the weekends and he he wasn't the nicest person in the world right you did and, I, i'm sure you didn't feel the fatherly love so to speak right <laughs> he you know i have a bit of a temper and uh sometimes i'm very negative sure I, I got that from him oh, okay but uh he said to us you can stay with me if you want my sisters chose to go with my mom to Texas. Okay. I chose to stay with my dad. Oh, okay. Why? I don't know. I think out of spite. I think I said to my mom, I'm not, you're not taking me to Texas, you know? Got it. And for me, like, as a kid, I don't know what was going on. Well, you don't, you, you don't, especially when it comes to moves, like, it's definitely, I mean, I remember, like, I, I moved, I moved, like, you know, from one city in Orange County to another city in Orange County, and I was like, Mo- like <laughs> fucking mom what are you doing you're uprooting me and like that feeling of just like yeah, if i was given an op take me to texas right and that's i that's a huge disconnect so <laughs> i move in with my dad for seventh eighth grade high school okay uh my brother is the person who my brother was into like the dead ken was that that was your half brother you yeah, were saying okay got it not even half step brother Oh, yeah, that's right. Stepbrother. Yeah, so yeah. he's into, like, Black Flag and the Dead Kennedys and stuff. So I give him all the, the 
the props. Credit or maybe for ruining my life. Right, right. <laughs> Here, um, here's the door he's opened. <laughs> Here you walk through it. So he was into this stuff and um Was he how how much older was he than you? He's a few months younger than me. Oh three okay. months younger than me. So uh And at, at like at that time were you um, well, one question, just like, did your, was your relationship with your mom kind of severed when you, ch- fuck yeah, it's okay. never been the same since up until then she was like the best, right? Not even the best. She was my mom. Right. Yeah. A good yeah. mom. Of course. But of course, you know, she didn't let me stay out late enough and stuff like that. Well, and yeah, I yeah. wasn't the best kid. So sure. And my whole life was sports and I listened to like Motley Crue and rap, like hair metal. And shit. Right. Well, because that's what was happening at the time. Yeah, and yeah. some some hip hop stuff, like like or rap at the time, like right. old rap, like Run DMC and Houdini and stuff. Like sure, that. sure. So my mom dropped me off at my dad's. I maybe I was bluffing, you know. She she knew more than me that my dad wasn't probably the best place for me to go. Right. She dropped me off. She went to Houston. I lived there for uh, six years. Right. Like, yeah. May, maybe in her head, she was just like. He, maybe she thought it, I was bluffing. Right. Like, maybe she's like, she's like, all right, in two weeks, Scott's going to call me up, like, crying and being like, okay, I I made a mistake. Like, I need to go to Texas. I think I'm too stubborn for that. <laughs> yes. So, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like your personality, the way you're describing yourself. So, yeah, we just lived with my dad. Right, right. Dealt with him. So did you uh, did you visit your mom or your sisters at all? I went there, like, once and twice. The funny thing is, within a year, she was done with the guy and... That was going to come back? With the post office, she transferred back to Fredonia, which is like, if you ever driven from Buffalo to Erie? Oh, yeah. It's, it's in the middle. It's the middle. So sure, she sure. was like an outs- hour outside of Buffalo. By the time, it took for a while to get back, though. Right, right. right. So within a, a couple of years, she was back, but I think in my head, I was like, fuck her. She left me. Right, right, right. And I was dealing with my dad, which wasn't the funnest thing. Right. You're like, I'm, I'm doing my thing already. I don't even need this to distract me. Good part. The only good part is, you know, my brother got me into music. Like, eighth grade, you know, seventh and eighth grade living there, I was, you know, still kind of into sports, kind of being a bad kid, getting what sort of yeah, like smoking so, weed and stuff. Right. Well, well, I mean, walk me through like because obviously you're you're, I mean, junior in high school is usually the formative years in which you know you start to figure your shit out. So like, what sports were you playing? Everything. Okay, anything Base, to get your hands baseball, on? Baseball, basketball, football. Uh, Were you playing like... Cross one year. Oh, wow. Um, like all organized though? Like Yeah. And, and were you playing like prior to that? Like did you do Little League and everything? Okay. Especially basketball. Like when, when I lived with my mom, I played on so many basketball leagues that <laughs> I'd have to play myself. Like I'd have to choose what team because I, I loved basketball. Yeah. I was, I was good at it. Really? So... What position was, did you play? Guard usually. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say you're not... But... And guard was like you could score a lot. So. Right, right, you're like I get to, I get to hold the ball. Ego got met. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I was just into sports. When I lived with my mom, I was just into sports and like being a kid, like oh well, yeah, like, doing dumb stuff, stealing beer. Drink. I can remember being like a little kid and stealing. I was never meant to be straight edge. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stealing like liquor, like wine from my mom, hiding it in the woods and drinking it and stuff. And, and was that more? Was that more of a um, like you were doing that to you know act out, be rebellious, or was it like the group of friends that you were with? They were all kind of like doing this type of tomfoolery. At both. Okay. Both. <laughs> Got it. So. Yeah, sports and fucking yeah, yeah. Hair, Be, hair rock. Right. And the I think it's interesting that you like like you said, you know, sneak out the woods and drink. Like I definitely think even though Buffalo, like it's a large city, it's still smaller where I think that like that experience is definitely um more of a a smaller town experience where it's just like, you know, you're bored. Yeah, I mean, I I lived in the suburbs. Not until I was on my own, I never lived in the city. Right, right, right. Always on the outskirts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't hear me talk about the streets too much. In my right there. <laughs> <laughs> the streets. Yeah, that's true. But the uh, so I mean, do you think a lot of it also has to do with boredom, where you're just like you, there was nothing to do after sports, or yeah, you're just a kid, you know? Right. Just a fucking just sticking around, dumb white kid trying to figure out who you are, you know? Like, right, right, right. And so you're. Um, yeah, junior high, like, that's when the music world started to open up for you. And, like, did you, 
I presume your uh, stepbrother, like, did he was he the one to take you to like your first show and stuff like that? Well, I I had gone to fucking concerts, like that yeah, shit, and I, I loved it. I loved music even even before like music. I loved it. Uh huh. Even before like underground music, so right. Was it um, like was your how was your parents exposed you to musically that you were like? Uh, my parents were into good music. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know, like Billy Joel. My mom, sure. My mom and dad both liked. Uh, Got it. So kind of stuff that my dad was also into the Grateful Dead, which I can still to this day can't, can't stand. Sure, but sure. he, you know, they were both definitely into music and okay. had vinyl collections and, and stuff like that. Right. I remember my mom's boyfriend at one point mm-hmm. gave me two Black Sabbath records, oh. which was fucking awesome. Right. Right. I go, the first vinyl I had were two Black Sabbath records, <clears throat> Kiss Alive two. That I bought at a garage sale just because probably visually it was the well, same. Of course, right. <clears throat> and then I had like ACDC Back in Black and, and Def Leppard Pyromania. Pyromania, probably. yeah, sure. <clears throat> so that stuff. But my, my parents were into like some hippie shit, some like folk shit. Right. And well, because that's obviously their, like that was their generation sort of like protest music in a way. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, my brother was like into punk stuff right and for me i went to some punk shows with him i, I saw the dead milkman that's in amazing probably like 1986 or 1987 i saw like the butthole surfers uh that and that's funny because that was like obviously the era where like punk was so strange like they didn't know like where they were taking it yeah and i did you know i was just it was brand new to me and you know i was definitely younger for the crowd there and it was just it was uh Definitely, like, getting my feet wet in mm-hmm. underground music. And, you know, I like I like the vibe of it, mm-hmm. but the whole punk sound and look to me never appealed to me. Like, right. You, that you were, whole, like, anarchy Liberty shit, Spikes, sure, that, sure. Like, that shit was a turnoff to me. Mm. But I did go with him and went more with him, and I think because I was attracted to the energy. Right. And then... uh we saw Night Flight, uh, Another State of Mind, the Social Distortion movie. I lo- of course. I loved Another State of Mind, the Social Distortion record, for some reason. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I saw that movie. It's incredible. And they did the Minor Threat bit, which, you know, they interview Minor Threat, and they show him practicing, and, you know, they, they talk about the straight edge thing, which, again, like, I was, I've right. never been straight edge. Right, you're like... I don't think I ever will be. Right. But I'm all for it. I think it's a great thing, but it's not me. Right, right. But it showed them, and they were like shaved heads, yeah, yeah. and like, and that was, I think, the first hardcore band I saw. And right. I think I went and bought their vinyl, mm-hmm. and then uh, I remember a kid, a kid we kind of hung out with, but when he went to a Catholic school, okay, so I didn't go to school with him. He gave me or my brother like a was a cassette with uh, Don't Forget the Struggle and Victim and Pain on it. Oh, wow. And that was it. You know, for me... Aesthetically, you were looking for something where it's like you, you saw yourself in it, like in yeah, a way. I, I couldn't... Right. My brother was kind of dressing kind of freaky with combat boots and mohawks. I couldn't... That shit. I never even considered it. Right. I never even like took my hair and went like this to see how it <laughs> right. would look. It wasn't me. It wasn't right. Gonna be me. I just... I love, I love how that was because usually, you know, when you're a teenager, you're kind of like... Well, if you're exposed to it enough, you're like, well, I might as well try it. But you were like, Hell nope, no. that's not happening. But once I saw Minor Threat, right, I, I saw that there was this different thing called hardcore. Yeah, and they're still even on the punk side of hardcore. Of course, you know? of course. And then I got that cassette, right? And I think from like maybe Thrasher and Maximum Rock and Roll, I kind of figured out there was a hardcore scene, right? So I remember I went to the record store in Buffalo. And Home of the Hits? Yeah. Yeah. Spectacular one, story. One day, in one fucking day, I bought the No For An Answer 7-inch, the Sick Of It All 7-inch, the Chain Of Strength 7-inch, and the Side By Side 7-inch. Because that's what they had. In of the course. Right, section. right. And I just picked them up, and these dudes had shaved heads, and they were jumping. They are probably all X'd up. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. even know if I know what that I, I did, probably, because from another state of mind. But, right. And that was it. That, yeah, that, that that was your introductory starter pack. That was like... That was it. Yeah, from, from that point on. From that point on, I would... You know, go go through Maximum Rock and Roll. Yep. If I had nine dollars, I'd order money orders three seven inches of anyone with short hair, right? And a fucking sweatshirt and a jumping, champion hoodie, right, right? Or like some dude that looked like a mean skinhead dude, you know? <laughs> right? Right. Anything like that, I'd mail order it. 
And so a did lot you, of it was good. Some of the, sometimes you'd get a dud, you know. Yeah, but that was the risk you took when you were mail ordering would blind. Just come home from school, and be like ah, nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then mail order would take like six months. Right, right. You're <laughs> like, I hope I get this. And it's like obviously, Period. right? The idea of customer service did not exist. <laughs> Unless you're going to send a letter and then get it back eventually three months later, like, oh, yeah, here's your order. We forgot it. Yeah. In conjunction with that, like your high school experience, I presume, like, is it one of those things where once music became such an important part, sports kind of got dropped? A hundred percent. Yeah. High school year and I played football, basketball, I think just football and basketball and lacrosse. I went out for the lacrosse team and made it, but I quit. OK. Maybe that's when. So, yeah, yeah. So like. Eighth grade that summer, I started getting into hardcore and going to shows. Right. When school started freshman year, I think I just said, fuck everything else and quit. So just, sophomore year, nothing. Just dove right just in. Just music. And right. Smoking, that was your identity. Smoking weed. Right. Being a hardcore kid. And <laughs> did you... Uh, Working did, stupid jobs. And, right. Just to be able to get that $9 to mail to the seven inches. <laughs> like, did you care about school at all? Was it one of those things where you were like, No. no. Just when I was in high school, yep. I smoked weed in the morning. I smoked weed in school. Right. The in I school, li- like in the bathrooms, like, like to- yeah. I <laughs> lived, anywhere you could. I right? lived on the street next to the school, so if I could sneak home, it was just like weed. <laughs> right. But it's not. I mean, I smoke weed now a couple times a year. When right. I'm like right. Drunk and someone has weed. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, dude. That's cool. But, right. But yeah, at the time, I was just like smoking weed and. Shows and, and it, it's it's funny because obviously like everything uh within the hardcore scene at that time like you know was so predominantly straight edge like that was the reality for sure and like you, that's funny you were it, it's funny that you were able to identify with all that but you're just like well yeah that isn't me because i'm already coming to the table not yeah. being that and i'm not interested in yeah that. I, don't, I don't know why i mean yeah were the still, were, were your, a lot of my friends are straight edge yeah and yeah then, like the the kid that uh you know, there was one other high, hardcore kid in my school. He uh-huh. was totally straight edge. Right. Uh, got Christian it out. Of course, and, right. <laughs> and we did zines together and stuff. And uh, Right. Yeah, I don't know. It just... Yeah, just wasn't of interest to you. I, I wish. Right. <laughs> did you... Uh, and the, like, the friends that you were, you know, being a, a quote-unquote delinquent with, were they privy to anything that you were into as far as, like, you know, punk and hardcore? Like, did they have any concept of what it is you were into? It's it's weird in high school. Like I got along with every group of people. Yeah, the like the Grateful Dead people that sure. wore ponchos and tie dyes. The Deadheads. Yeah, I yeah. bought weed off them. Right. The few weirdos because I was like I didn't look like a weirdo, but I was a weirdo too. Right. And then like uh, the nice preppy kids. Uh huh. I think probably the, I don't know. Just Maybe because you played some sports, played like some those, sports, yeah. and went to parties once in a while and stuff. So right, you know. Got along with pretty much everyone. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you're pretty... But they would be like, what is that Judge shirt? What does that mean? And I'd be like, it's music. Oh, you know, just like typical. Yeah. Like, oh, kill your mom music. I'd be like, yep, that's exactly what it is. That's kill your <laughs> mom music. That's incredible. I've never heard that description. Like, I, I've usually described it as like, anytime anybody that has no idea what... what independent music is and just like oh yeah the stuff that parents hate but like kill your mom music that's like perfect i remember in high school when uh metallica Mm -hmm. put out the song one oh yeah in the video and like all my like normal jock friends somehow totally got into that yeah yeah and then from that at least then they could like relate right to the type of music so then from there, they would, like, occasionally Check in on you? From yeah, me. yeah. And then they came to a few shows, and they were like, this stuff's crazy. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They never really took to it. Well, right, right. They, yeah, they never were like, this but is what I'm doing. Metallica dead. 1 definitely got people in my high school open. Yeah, that was, like, the tipping point a little. Yeah. It wasn't kill your mom anymore. Right, so right. Bang your head. Again. That's so funny. <laughs> and so when you're, uh, once you started to kind of, you know, sophomore year, you started to dive into this head first, like... How was, I mean, like you mentioned before, your relationship with your father was already pretty strained as you moved in. Like, as you were getting into this, like, did he have any concept in, of what you were getting into? And, like, was he terrified when you started to, like, bring all these records home? And uh, They definitely had a concept because me and my brother both played every instrument. So they would have to hear it. And uh, 
Oh, so you at that at that point you were playing like guitar and stuff like that. I played drums. My brother played guitar. Oh, I didn't. Know. I never knew that you you had a, a drumming yeah, background. I got a little bit of drumming. Interesting. There's a a record by a band called Fade Away. Of course. Um, oh yeah. Of the world. That's right. I, played drums on that. I, for, I totally. I don't know why that <laughs> left my memory, but yeah. That's okay. Not, got not it. That memorable. The band's pretty good though. The band's pretty good. <laughs> got it. Um, so was it was it because your brother was like, all right, Scott, you're gonna play drums. And I'm gonna go ahead and take guitar. Something like that. Right. I don't know exactly. We gotta we gotta we gotta fill a band up. <laughs> but but it happened. And then uh Yeah, I mean they knew they Yeah. They didn't I don't think they cared. They didn't care. They weren't like yeah. giving us money to go to shows and making sure we had a ride, anything like right, that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, they weren't like, I'll drop you off at the yeah. local VFW or whatever. So Yeah. My, they just they kinda tolerated it. They kind of tolerated it. Okay. They, uh, so, I saw this band called uh, Solid State. Okay. Who went on to be Snapcase. Yeah. And they had the the original singer of Snapcase, this kid, Chris Gallas. Sure. was a fucking awesome front man. Mm-hmm. He just would while out on stage. Sure. And he, like, he looked good doing it. Right. And I remember seeing that and being like, I can do that. Okay. Like, you know, I could do that. So up until that point, all the shows that you had gone to, like, did you have that desire? Like, I would like to play. And up I'd to like... that point, I was playing drums. Not right. So well. Got right. <laughs> so I'd see this front man and I was like, I could do that. Right. So we, we were going to this club, the River Rock Cafe so much. Me and my brother would be at every show. Sure. And so, so much that we became friends with the, sound man sure who ran the place who was the owner's son of course and this was the only club in buffalo at the right time. right i mean if if let's say the chromax came they would play a huge place at the rock like the local rock venue sure huge place right but any hardcore show like i saw every band like yeah gorilla but every band you could think of sure from that era buffalo was really lucky because we're close to new york city so right I they wanted to play another place. I see sure. a lot of places, a lot of bands. Right. So somehow we talked to the owner and mm-hmm. we started a band with him. Well, the owner's son. The owner's son. He was basically the man in charge of the venue. Of course. So he played drums. Okay. My brother played guitar. I sang. Right. And we got some other dudes and we started Slugfest, Slugfest. which is my first hardcore band. Sure. And, you know, it was cool. We could practice at the venue. Sure. That was, right. I mean, that I... I it's a very a very strategic move of you to like. Did you actually like the dude? Like, was he cool or was it like? It wasn't strategic. It okay. Was we had no concept of anything like. I know. I mean, it's strategic in the sense of like, wow, we can have a place to practice. Right. Like you're like you're like like the sound you know the sound guys. We didn't scheme. And be like, all right. Yeah. Like we'll invite him in, and then that way we can practice there. Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> but another thing to our advantage that we didn't think of. Yeah. Our first show was with Judge. Like, he yeah. could just get us on show. Totally. Someone's coming through. Here we go. Probably weren't ready to right. play with Judge, but... But um, at, at that age, you have no concept yeah, of... Whatever. Right. Like, I want to play a show, of course. Yeah. Yeah. We started sets off with, like, cover songs. Cover songs, of course. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> You're like, maybe 50% of our set <laughs> yeah. will be a cover. It's fine. <laughs> so, we... Uh, and was it one of those things, like, once you, like, once you actually played your first show with Slugfest, it was it, like... That you're like, okay, this this is this is the position I'm comfortable with. Like as far as like singing for a band. I think so. Yeah. I don't know, but I think so. Yeah. I yeah, I mean it's true because you've never obviously done something else for a prolonged period of time. I just that's too long ago. But right. I, I think so. <laughs> right, right. I think once I went to a hardcore show, that was it. I didn't care about anything else. And then probably once I played in a band, I don't think I don't think that I thought it would ever be like this, that I'd be fucking 39 right. still doing this. Right. For a living, I guess. Right. But, yeah, I think that was it. That yeah, was yeah, yeah. Weird. You know, any job I had had to be around going to shows or I was lying to get to the show. Or right. I was quitting right. to get to the show. Right. Any girlfriend I had... Had to fit within the car. Not, not important. Right. If she had a car and could take me to shows, that was cool. <laughs> like, that was important. Right. But, and then, you know, with bands, and then you, you actually start going out of town. Right. To other cities, and then you're like, then there's a whole new the world. Whole new world, there, right, right. Which is cool, too, because then you start to, like, I think with more Chris Logan talk, 
Yeah. I would say he maybe booked our first out of town show and me and Tim, who ended up being the drummer for Snapcase, were in Slugfest. Right. And um, you know, I think that was our first road trip. That was our first tour. Tour, right, right. Playing Hamilton, which right. was like an hour. Right. But we had to get over the border. Of course. And then we go to this different city and he put out the seven inch. So sure. that they actually knew some of the songs. Right. And they went wild and and I remember me Chris lost money on the show for right. that. We, we probably got $50. <laughs> right, right, right. So he probably lost $100. Right. But still paid us. And this was all completely foreign to of us. Of course. You're like, yeah, and you didn't show up being like, oh, here's our rider. Here's yeah, our, yeah, yeah. Nothing like <laughs> no, that. No, of course not. <laughs> and if he, and he still paid us being like, oh, I'll lose money, but I want you guys to not lose money. And we're like, he's the coolest right. dude in the whole, <laughs> yeah. that was the most hardcore thing I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. Like who pays bands to play shows like yeah. us? Like yeah. what? So, and then you know, eventually we played Detroit and Erie and Syracuse. Right. Syracuse like Syracuse in the nineties was the fucking it was the hotbed. Of course, it was insane. Totally it was because you had so. I mean, so many bands, so many kids, like an actual venue that was yeah. able to do stuff. And and McKeg was just a master of right booking. Yeah, he knew. I would go to Syracuse at least twice a month. And yeah, such it, good shows. Right, that was your spot. The uh, <clears throat> I think it's interesting that you hit on the point where you were saying where it's like obviously there, you were so focused on hardcore, like this was this was your world. This is all you want to dedicate your time to. This is all you want to dedicate your resources to. Um, because like I mean, for all intent and purposes, like people could look at you back then versus you now, and obviously you've changed and matured and developed in some ways. But in other ways, you're like, I'm pretty much the same person I was when I was back then as far as my focus is concerned. Like, I mean, you're, you're at this point, you're obviously a lifer. You're going to be doing this until, like, you can't walk, probably. Yeah, that might be soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I'm like... <laughs> you're like, oh, I don't know about this. Um, and the kind of, kind of what we were talking about before we were recording, where it's like, you know, the... Uh, because you were definitely, um, and I've always felt this about, like, especially what you're doing or what you've been doing with terror over the past, you know, was it 11 years now? Yeah. That you you were definitely, like, I don't care if you're a fan of aggressive music, whatever label you want to put on it, you put you guys up on stage and what it is that you do, people will be fans of it. Like, that's just a reality because of, like, how you interact with the crowd and, like, how you are, like, you, you're not a... You're not a character on stage, but you know how how you are. Um, and people, like I said, like I was saying earlier, it's like people have such a preconceived notion of who Scott Vogel is, and like, oh yeah, like this is you were constantly speaking like you do on stage, like <laughs> like here's here's you know Vogelism after Vogelism, like that's just yeah, it's just like I walk on and I have Madball on headphones all the time, and right, and it's like. It's hard for people to like. If people could imagine that all I listen to is Coldplay, right? More than anything else, they'd probably be blown away, you know? Right. And <laughs> I, I just and I mean, like you know, sitting here in your living room, I'm like looking at all the Circus Survive posters, and it's just like those are my girlfriends, right? <laughs> and 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 it's just it's it's. I think you're the you're what you're into musically and obviously what, I mean, cause in, in every interview and everything that you get across, it's like, you know, you, you definitely admit like, you know, you're not hiding who you are as a person as far as like <laughs> the bands you like. And it's like, I think, I think that's great because obviously it expands kids musical palettes because ultimately they should be listening to stuff. I've had like a, the, the bass player, how water music's come up to me and said, like, you have no idea how many kids tell us like, we saw the singer of Terror loves you guys. So we check you out, and now we love you. And it's like, that's great. So they're like, they're, yeah, they're, the they're your band. band. Yeah, they're your so band. Amazing, right? And I fucking hated them when I first heard them. Right. When I first heard Hot Water Music, <laughs> when I was in Buried Alive, I lived with almost the whole band. I right. Right. <laughs> and they would play Hot Water Music in the van. I was like, this shit's so right. Terrible. It's terrible. And then there was this one song, uh, Three Summers, mm -hmm. that they play. And I was like, this song's fucking 
house. Yeah, you're like, why do I also I would, like this? I literally, when no one was home, go take the cassette <laughs> out of his That's so great his room, right, and listen to it, right, and then put it back, right. You're and like, then eventually one day I was like, yeah, they're not so bad. Yeah. Like, Yo, like, when are they playing again? Like, <laughs> you know? Dude, like same thing with like just like two years ago. Uh huh. We were, we we're driving and David, our bass player, and yep. our roadie, Smackman, were yep. up front. It was the middle of the night and I woke up and there was this horrible song on and I was like, this is so awesome, but it was so bad. And like, right, right. I don't know if you're going to know the song when I get to it. And I was like, I don't want to ask who it is. I don't want to admit I want to know. And I was like, I just wish one of them would say it. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, this is the new Set Your Goals song with the girl from Paramore. I don't know. Do you know that song? Yeah, I know. It's I know. It's yep. so yep. bizarre. Like, she totally. comes in. She's like, hey, you know what I'm doing? Yep. It totally had me, though. And I was like, ah. And so then I was like, I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I'm on board, and man. I was like, that's the worst song. It's so weird. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you're like, I like it. Well, I, and I like that you can, you can reconcile that in your own head where you're just like, I can admit I like what I like because a lot of people I mean obviously you're older now but like you know when you know when you're a teenager like there's always that sort of like shame factor if like your yeah, friends aren't into it I was like that then. everybody's <laughs> like that yeah and, and I think it's like when you're able to get over that hump and be like you know what like fuck it I, I'm sorry I like this like when when Quicksand came out yep I loved it because it was members of the Today and Girl business right. but if you would have given me that record blindly and be like Check out this hardcore record. I'm mean, like, hey, get this out of here. This is fucking hardcore, you know, like. Right. <laughs> but they had like the the New York hardcore right, stamp they, on it, so right. it was okay. They had the pedigree. Which so was, thank yeah. thank God those guys brought some melody into hardcore because I sure needed it. You right. Know? Yeah. You're like but if someone else would have like you know right given it to me. I would have like, no, no, no. This <laughs> is terrible. Um, the. Like, obviously, when you were playing in bands back in Buffalo, like, you know, Slugfest, well, Despair and Buried Alive, like, I mean, well, especially with Slugfest and Despair, like, the concept of, like, making making a living off of a band, like, that didn't really exist. It was making a loss. Right. right. <laughs> it was, like, work all week so you can pay gas money to go play in Cleveland and not even make gas money, so. Right. It's like paying to play. Right. Which was fine. <laughs> Paying, I like that. Paying to play, and the uh, so like was because to me, Buried Alive seemed like the first band that you were able to take, quote unquote, professionally in the sense of like you could kind of get out there. You had a label to support you that was like you know. So like, did but all this time, like you were saying, like you know, there was never any plan B. Like you weren't like, I'm going to have this career. Like or or was there something always in the back of your head where like, oh, if this. I never had a plan A even though. Right. There was no plan B, but there was no A plan either. It okay, was just right, right. Play in bands, go to shows and work telemarketing or whatever right. to be able to live, you know? Right. I don't think I ever thought about a career anything. type. Yeah. Never. Right. I mean I went to like a community college for like a semester and fuck that and Right. The thing with like all my bands up till terror, like we all put out okay songs and played and toured a little, but I was too crazy. Like, right. I was like a fucking Nazi and like would freak out and would want everything done my way. And yeah. So you, I mean, you were like, you were a control freak. Like that was kind of, and an asshole. Right. And people, I, I don't know for sure. You'd have to ask them, but I would imagine people would be like, fuck this. I don't want to be around this. Right. With 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 buried alive, it was like I was like that, and the people in the band started to like get into weird music and mm-hmm. told me to stop talking about hardcore on stage, and I was like, I'm done, you know. Yeah. So every band I did was okay, and you know, got you know, I knew some people, and you know the way right. the way it should work. People give you shows, you let people stay at your house, but of course. Not. But we always broke up. So. Right. <laughs> So there was never any... Uh, it, it always rose a little, but there right. was never any potential. Or there was never any... Like... You cool. never really saw what the full potential was. Right, right. And so, uh, like we were mentioning, that those years where, you know, obviously, like, Buried Alive and Ended and Terror had yet to begin. Like, you you know, you were living in Arizona. Like, would... So up, up to that point, were you always living in, in Buffalo? And then you moved to Arizona? That was the first kind of... I lived uh, with Buffalo. Okay. 
Hold on one second. It's I'm fine. Just trying to see if this no, no, that's fine. Take it easy. Just want to make sure I'm not missing you know, anything. These big emergencies. Mm-hmm. I was I was living in Buffalo and yep. I started dating this girl in Chicago. Got it. Who I actually met at Victory. Oh, okay. She was the receptionist there. <laughs> and uh, random. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I remember I I went to Victory and saw her. And I was like, oh, she looks. I don't know. Yeah, you're like she's attractive. So whatever we we were dating and we wanted to be together, but she didn't want to move to Buffalo. I didn't want to move to Chicago. We just made this plan to move to California. Mm-hmm. And Buried alive broke up. Oh, okay. And uh, that's what happened. Okay. Buried alive broke up, and uh, the plan was always to move to California. Okay. My friend Mark in Arizona. Mm-hmm. This is kind of a crazy story. Okay. I hope he doesn't hear this because it might bum him out. Yeah. Uh, well. But, he had if, just, if it's your reality, that's okay. Well, he's my good friend. Right. This is definitely the reality. Right. He had just moved to Arizona uh-huh. and bought a brand new house, like built a house. Oh, okay. With his girlfriend who was going to college there. Got they it. moved down there. She was like, I'm moving back because of that. She was talking to another guy. Oh, okay. Yes. So he's down there now in this brand new house by himself. <laughs> yeah. The last Buried Alive tour... We did with Death Threat, and I knew I was quitting the band because I was going to quit the band before this, but we had already committed to committed it. to the right. tour, and they canceled a European tour to do this tour with us, and they were my friends. I didn't want to fuck them over. So on this tour, I told them, I was like, yeah, I'm quitting the band, and we're probably going to move to California. Mm-hmm. And he's like, why don't you come and live here with me? And he's like, where are you moving? And I was like, we don't know. He's like, come here, live with me, and then... Check out California, and then when you want to go to California, go to California. Yeah, so it's like a little yeah, it jumping like, off point, right? right. And he had this fucking beautiful house, and we're like, he's here all alone, right? All right, You're like, Arizona's yeah. almost California. Whatever. Yeah, it's like six hours away, no big deal. So we moved there, both got jobs. It was fucking great. I, I got this telemarketing job. I can't even like, obviously knowing who you are, like it, it would be. You you were probably pretty good at that. Oh, it's fucking amazing! At it. Right, like because you're you're like I, I imagine it's it was like kind of the same mentality that you you know you were like in high school where you're just like all I'm trying to do is trying to get along with this person and try to get them to obviously. Oh, it was so amazing! Really, it was like eighty. It what was, were you selling? It was Sears Home Improvements. Oh, so shit. I'd call people up, yeah, that owned a home, and say like. You know, we have appointments for estimates on siding, new windows, right. kitchen cabinets. Um, you know, we're going to have someone out in your area. It's a free estimate, no obligation. Yeah. When's better for you? Tuesday or Wednesday? Some people would go, fuck, go fuck yourself. Some people would say Wednesday. <laughs> right. And then you just make the appointment. Right. And obviously the person comes out there and tries to sell them on it. Of course. But... That's it, not it your job. It was a legitimate right. thing. It was well, yeah, Sears, yeah, yeah. too. Of so course. Old people were like, oh, Sears... So it was 80 people in the room or something. Yeah. Just grinding on making the f- so much money. Really? Because you got bonuses on appointments. Of course. And they do things like make eight appointments and go home. I was going home at noon getting paid eight hours. That's incredible. And then, then to get to the start of terror, but at the yeah. tail end of this loops into it. Yeah. I was so happy. No band. And I know you were just kind of you were no existing. No one was fucking judging me. No one was saying I was an asshole. Right. No one thought I was the coolest guy in the world and wanted to fucking talk to me. Right. I was just going to shows in Arizona. Exactly. The scene there was pretty small. Yeah. There wasn't shows all the time, but it was cool. Right. And then the first thing I got a call from Hundred Demons. They were like, oh. "We want you to sing for us," and I was like, "You're like, I don't weigh enough." Yeah, I was like. <laughs> Well, first of all, I was like, I just moved to Arizona. No way. And second of all, I was like, you guys. Yeah. People think I'm crazy. You're like really crazy. Dude. Right, right. You're legitimately I'm like not, certified. I'm not mean enough. I'm like, maybe my voice is mean enough, but I'm not mean enough. Yeah, totally. But I do think about how that would have worked out. That would have been super. I, I, yeah. I, I, been. It could have been really interesting. Yeah. I mean, musically, it's like obviously like That's, not too dissimilar to what yeah, terror yeah, is. Cool. Yeah. It could. Yeah, whatever. So I was just like, I just moved here. I can't. Right. You know, if there were 100 demons from L.A., it might have happened. But yeah. Then I got this. Then I came to L.A. Sure. You know, so me and my girl at the time were just visiting San Diego, L.A. And one of the times we came to L.A., uh-huh. I went to Mandel's house. Okay, yeah. And Larry from mm-hmm. Buffalo, who was my good friend, mm-hmm. gave me this tape. 
which was No Warning and Carry On. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God, I got to start a band. I was like, this shit is so good. It made me so psyched. It just put you back in the mentality. I was just like, then I went from I love not being in a band to like being like, Fuck 18 Visions. What's this shit? Bleep. Yeah. This isn't hardcore. This, I'm, tur- I'm like, turning this whole scene around. <laughs> I was just like... Yeah. I was just like, I gotta start a band. Yeah. But I was in Arizona and there wasn't really anyone there to start a band with. Right. So I get this phone call from John LaCroix, who's from 10 Yard Fight, Fight, from right. Boston. Right. And he's like, hey, Scott. I think it was a voicemail message. Like, I'm starting this... Ba- I heard you moved to Arizona. I'm starting this band... In uh, L.A. Mm-hmm. with dudes from Carry On, I was like, "I'm listening." I yeah. was like, "Yeah." So I hit him up, and he started. You know, he that that was the beginning of terror. Right. I drove to L.A., went to Nick's house where he currently lives now. Yeah. And we, I walked in, and what's up? They were both younger, and you know, they right. looked all right. They just looked like typical hardcore kids. Right. And they played and. You know, for, when you're in a hardcore band, you have a shitty drummer. It's not cool. Right, right. So he was, like, perfect, and Todd was perfect, and we went out to a strip club. And right. I was like, all right, I'm older than these dudes, but... Like, I can get down with it, right. look at boobs, and they don't mind that I'm drinking. And they, right. They know who judges, you know. This is cool. Right. So we are like, all right, we're moving to L.A. anyways. Let's start here. John LaCroix never showed up. He never showed up again. Right. He started the band, but never showed up. <laughs> That's incredible. So at the time, I was like, all right, I'll do the band, but I'm in this, my job in telemarketing. Right. I'm in this contest to win a Caribbean cruise, and I'm winning it. Like, Oh, I shit. So it was, like, it was like over like a six-month period. Yeah, or I'm yeah, like, yeah. I can't quit. So I go on. I win this Caribbean cruise. Amazing. Go to there. Come back. I'm like the Refresh, man. Refresh? Right, right. No, I'm like the man at work. I okay, yeah, yeah. Cruise, I walk in, and I quit. They're like, what the fuck? Really? Yeah, the next day. Was your boss just like, what? And on the crew, it was like a, it was like a Sears cruise for the whole company. Oh, so it was all, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. like these dinners and like, sure. I didn't go to any of them. I right. would see people in the hall, like walking. Yeah, yeah. And like, where have you been? I'm just like, just give yeah. them bullshit in. Right. Come back, quit. And you move to LA, not far from here. Yeah. The studio, tiny, shitty apartment. Sure. And terror stars. And that's, yeah, I... It's funny that like to hear you describe the reaction of like what you felt when you listened to you know No Warning and Carry On and like the the reaction that because obviously by that time like early two thousands like or I mean no not even that like late nineties that was what was happening within hardcore like all those type of bands were especially in Southern California like you know I mean like especially totally and so like I'll never I, I will never forget when you guys because I I'm fairly certain that we played the same because we both played Hellfest in two thousand. One, I want to say I can't remember um, but you guys I think you played on it was because you played the same stage as we did and I was like this is going to be because by this time I'd seen you guys once or twice like I think I was at like the second headline show like headline record show you guys did and it was I mean when you guys came out and started to play it was one of those things where it definitely you know there's a different energy with that was like your agenda was being uh, explained very clear, very cohesively. People like, <laughs> okay, like I know what this band's about. There's no mincing words. Like I get it. But I just remember that reaction at Hellfest being like, Jesus, like, f- are you fucking kidding me? Like people are like, I, I, I don't remember the show so clearly. Sure. But I remember we had the Eagle shirt. Right. And at that festival, not even the crowd, but so many people in bands were yep. wearing that shirt. Totally. I was like, I was like all right. Yeah, we're on to something. I know. Was it was it be all right? Was it weird for you to like you know kind of hit the ground running and like have so much? um, uh, Well, I mean, for lack of a better term, like hype kind of going into it, where it was like, oh wow, like we have we have four song demo guys. Like, calm down. Yeah, I don't know. I I think everything was happening so fast. Right, there wasn't even time. Like you were, but but this, but I mean, you were prepared because you'd done it as much as I wish we were a little more prepared right right we're going on tour with a box of shirts when we should have had like two different designs and a couple boxes you know right right but at the time it was just like everything happened fast right and you had no time to react besides what was like right in front of you and we just we started playing and then we just 
kept getting shows and kept getting tours. And I don't think we ever, when we started the band, I actually, I think we did. I think we said, let's do this as much as possible. Right. So, and I mean, with what I said before, like all mm-hmm. my bands had like <clears throat> started and then just died. Right. I think I wanted to like, I think I feel like I had something to prove. Like, well, yeah, it was your, it, 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 for all intent and purposes, it was like your first real true, like go of it. I, and I never felt like I had a, you know, now when I like think like if you go to a record store, right. Like stocks records, which is hard to find now. Right. Terror has like a section of like six records. That's like fucking insane to me. Yeah. But at the time I just wanted to be like, I want to be able to go tear or buried alive and despair had gone to Europe. Yep. But I wanted to go to Japan. I wanted to do all these things. I, and I, I saw, all these people in bands that I thought sucked right. doing all these things and drawing 500 people. Right. Which, you know, Terror has always been, a, you know, like you said, a straight up hardcore band. So there's only somewhat of an appeal to that. Of course. But I think I said, if we're going to do this, let's do it. I'm not getting any younger. Right. If I'm going to keep doing bands, let's go for it. And I think that the Nick and Todd were young and hungry. and Right. It was just kind of like a, a, a perfect combination of everybody's interests, like aligning. Because it is, it is difficult when you're younger to have, especially, you know, like whatever, late teens, early 20s. Because girls can ruin everything. Totally. <laughs> and so, and like, yeah, between between relationships, between like Parents, career college. demands. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's so fucking hard to keep shit together. Like the most simplest advice you can like, you know. Obviously, people ask you all the time, like, oh, fucking, how do you keep a band together? And it's just like, you just you just keep a band together. Like, that's the hardest thing a band can do. You got to, like, you got to have the heart. And if someone gets out, you got to find the, the right replacement. I mean, we've right. had so many member changes. Yes, you have. It's like, <laughs> once, once someone hints at they're not into it anymore, you can't try to talk them into staying. No. What's That's like your girlfriend. You, wants to break up with you if you say please I'll change right I'll get a rose for you you're not gonna change (laughs) no no not at all but Uh, I mean every like I think something cool about Terror is like you look at all the different lineups like we had Todd at one point yeah that was a certain era and then we had Frank from Integrity and Ringworm who's now in Hapri that was a different area era and then we had like Busky and Doug and Carl from First Blood and like all these people It, it wasn't like you think of Terror and you're like who was that dude? Every one of the band was like in other bands and stuff, and right, they're all still doing stuff in involved. So right, well, yeah, we you have this revolving line. I think if you took like a chart of every member of Terror, what bands they were in, and all of our road crew, you'd be like, whoa, it'd probably be pretty. <laughs> yeah, you, you'd probably be able to make the you know like three three degree yeah you know how the, how they do like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever yeah. they probably there's a lot of people that could easily do that with you where it's just like how many bands will it take for me to get to Scott Vogel like maybe two maybe three <laughs> um, and sort of uh, like you know to to wrap things up um, the two things where it's like can you like do you find yourself having a difficult time like when just because terror is so active like when you are home to be able to like decompress and relax or are you always kind of like forced to think about like, Oh shit. Like I got to think about what our next tour is. And like, is it, it's tough for you to kind of like step out of it for a second. When we're off tour, I kind of have a nice balance. Like I wake up early usually nowadays Yep. and I have my list of things to do like this. That's good. I like that. And I, a lot of them have to do with tear. Right, right. <laughs> and I do that like a normal job. And that keeps, you know, that keeps uh, our merch stores stocked with new designs. And right. And on tour and stuff. And then when the evening hits, I love to just watch TV for like four hours or go to the movies or do right. normal things. So. Right. But yeah, I'm always on terror. My mind's always on terror. I'm not, you know, there's people in the band that don't do too much, which, you know, you don't need five liters. Yeah, too many cooks in the kitchen, I, right? I, I keep everything going, and, and you know, yeah, I still have that control freakness in me. Yeah, it's not the same anymore. I don't try to present it as a asshole. No, it's just honestly because that's like I'm glad you mentioned that because like I when when I was working with you at Century Media, that was I mean obviously I was already going into it having respected you as a person and like you know considered you a friend. I like, to see that was crazy. No, but like the <laughs> uh, in all of the you know in any issues that we had professionally or whatever, like you you were you were well tempered about it. I mean I, I I will be completely honest in admitting like. 
I was scared to deal with you like business wise <laughs> and like not like just because it's like, you know, I mean, it's tough, like especially when you're in the hardcore scene and you're kind of like, well, there are a lot of friends that work together and sometimes those, you know, relationships default, you know, that shit. But once I started to work with you and everything that we were working on together, I was like, well, for one, you were on top of it. Two, you weren't afraid to call the label on its shit. And three, you were also willing to listen, like actually listen to me if I was explaining something. And I was like, it, for me, it just, it, it marked any sort of negative impression I had from, you know, oh, fucking, like you're saying, Scott Bogle's a fucking asshole, like <laughs> difficult to deal with or whatever. It was kind of all thrown out where I was just like, no, like if you are coming at me like heated, you know, we're able to talk about it and get through it like adults do, like normal people should do. And so I, I think that just like you were saying, that kind of, you know, with age comes a temperance of like being able to compress <laughs> and be able to like, all right, I can. Not things. I remember like I can remember like being in a van driving to D.C. and yep. you get a flat tire and I'd be like, if we miss the show, the band's over. My whole world's going to end. Right. Now if we get a flat tire, I'm like. Oh, we might miss the show. Can we just go to a hotel right now? <laughs> like everything will be okay. <laughs> right. You're like, it's not so life or death. Like that is the yeah. way that is the name of the terror song, but that is completely <laughs> fucked. Like, I can really remember being like, if this van breaks down right now, I'm gonna I'm gonna run, I'm gonna jump in front of a moving car. Right. Now I'm just like, Yeah. God, can we have the day off? <laughs> You're like, can- people don't need to see us again tonight. This is, our, this is our third time through <laughs> Omaha in in a year and a half. They're okay. Yeah. Um, and the uh, I think this will be a good spot to wrap up where um, the – because obviously because you've done so much random shit within the hardcore scene, like the – have there have there been any sort of like out-of-body moments where it's like, you know, either it was like a, a distinct show or festival that you were playing where it was just like – this is weird. I can't believe, like, it gave you a perspective. Weird or good? Like, like, I mean, weird, like, in a good way, where you're just like, this is weird. Like you were saying, you're like, you know, I, I can't believe that I've been able to do terror as a, a career or whatever. Like, if there was any of those, like, distinct moments that, like like I said, you sort of floated out of your body and you're like, wow, this is... We we played this With Full Force Festival. Yep, I'm in, familiar. In Germany uh, two year, two summers ago. Okay. And this would have been like the fifth time we played it, but we've always played the small stage. And the small stage is 10,000 people. The big stage is when we played, it was like 20, 30,000 people. And it's a huge fucking stage. It's fucking insane. And we had watched bands. You know, we, we did the, the second stage good. Right. Like crazy. They moved us to the big stage. And I remember getting up there and waiting because you have like an hour. There's someone on the small stage where you set up. Oh, okay. And I'm like, it's the daytime. It's probably like three o'clock. And I'm looking and the crowd starts filling in. And I'm like drinking more to get through this. And I'm fucking scared shitless. And we start playing. And I I think people, like the organizers estimate how many bands. Of course. They said like 27,000 people watched us. Crazy! It's it was amazing. insane. Right. And it like I have pictures of it. I seen videos of it, and it's like insane. And like after that, you know, and then the next day, that's the weekends. The next day, you go play for a hundred people, right? And like with a no stage, right? In Belgium or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anywhere. So like after that, I was like, tear. Like I have so much respect for tear because.